He's smoking, I don't know what that is. He, you can't read the bubble, but he's saying like, cussing, God isn't real. Uh, and he has a unibrow, like really? Is that necessary? Here's the thing though, this kid is eight. No pastor is sitting this kid down. I really don't think that's the case. No pastor is sitting this kid down and saying, this is what a Christian looks like, this is what an atheist looks like. This is what the kid is just growing up in. It's the culture, it's what he's picking up from, I don't know, maybe his family, maybe his church. But even though no one's telling him this, likely, somehow this is the impression that he gets. That Christians are good, if you're not a Christian, you're that. Emmett Mehta, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs all the way from your home in Chicago. You are an author, blogger, and activist known online as the Friendly Atheist and also as that guy who sold his soul on eBay. We'll be talking about that and the book that resulted from that very unorthodox auction, as well as your upbringing as part of the Jain religion, one of the world's oldest faiths still in practice to this day. So great to see you, Hemant. Um, so what have you been up to today is it a blogging day or a youtube video day or <laughs> perhaps just a chilling out day yeah hey mark thank you so much for having me today was a lot of uh writing and podcasting so got that out of wow. the way and so yeah it changes depending on what's in the news and what i need to rearrange to make sure everything i can cover what i need to cover well, people know you, of course, as an atheist who broke out of a religious upbringing. What they might not know is that your family practices Jainism, an ancient Indian religion that not a lot of Western people are all that familiar with. So let's just start with your childhood. What does it mean to be a Jain and what was expected of you? Uh, the main thing about Jainism, as far as I knew, and keep in mind, I don't have an academic scholarly uh, understanding of Jainism. Mm. I'm telling you what I knew from growing up and what I experienced personally. And the biggest thing that was told to me as a child is Jainism is all about nonviolence. So you're not supposed to hurt other beings. You're not supposed to think mean thoughts. Mm. And honestly, philosophically, that sounds fine and good. Like our world would be a better place with all that, right? But that meant in practice, it meant you're vegetarian as strict as you can be. Um, we had a temple growing up, or at least a makeshift, because we didn't have the money for uh, a real temple where I lived and stuff. But by and large, it was something we did in my family, not so much a huge community that met all the time. And it depends on like if we live in a community where there are other Jains, we would try to get together with them once every few weeks. Um, but you know, it wasn't a traumatic experience or anything, it's not like hmm. I regret or feel any anger about growing up in that particular religion. When I was um, 13 or 14, my family moved, consequential because I was about to start high school. And so, you know, I had my friends. I was excited to have this big start, you know, something new. And all of a sudden, I'm transported to another city where I don't know anybody. Um, and it's always a hard thing when you're a child and it's always fine, like by and large, it's fine once you're actually there. But I do remember when when we made the move, it got me wondering, why would God even put me through this? Why would God take away something I really liked so much? And it's not that I suddenly became an atheist. It's that mm -hmm. I had given myself permission to ask questions about God, about a higher power. And I should say, Jains technically don't even believe in like a God that answers your prayers and, and all oh. the stuff Christians believe about God. Um, honestly, I think I've heard academics say Jains don't even believe in a God the way uh, we tend to think about God. But I know growing up, if you ask my parents, do they believe in God? The answer is yes. If you ask people in my Jain community, do they believe in God? The answer is yes. Like there's a huge discrepancy between what I'm told Jainism is about and how we actually practiced it. But, um, I started questioning the idea of God. And as I researched that, and by research, I mean trying to find answers on like AOL dial-up uh, mm. back in the day, uh. I, re I came across people writing about why God doesn't make sense as a concept, why religion is wrong, not any particular religion is wrong. 
And mm. all of it just like, it made sense. It's so weird that these people I'd never met and had no idea who was doing the writing were saying these things that seemed to make so much sense. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more it just seemed to click. You know mm. what I mean? And so yeah. within the course of a month or two, I think I went from believing in God to questioning God to wow. thinking, I don't think any God exists. And it happened so quickly and no one was pushing me there, but I kind of landed there on my own. And over the course of the you know next few years, it seemed like every bit of evidence I found, everything I read, it just seemed to confirm that hunch. And I think that's part of the story is pretty universal among a lot of atheists I'd met. Like they start questioning God and when they really dig into it and ask questions, mm -hmm. they were always either given bad answers to or told just have faith or just, you know, don't ask that stuff. When they actually did the research themselves, like yeah. it seemed to make sense. And it's not the I'm doing my own research, so I'm in a rabbit hole and I'm only looking at people who agree with me. It's that... I'm looking at people who I consider to be smart and everything around me, even in subsequent years, like I feel like I landed in the right place. So it, that was about 14. It wasn't until I was like 18 or 19 that I actually wanted to meet other atheists and get to get involved in more activism. Well, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, what are the origins of Jainism and what exactly do Jains believe? Yeah, this is another one of those things where there might be a discrepancy between academics and people who actually practice it. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's been around for thousands and thousands of years. I've read that it influenced Mahatma Gandhi, who was not Jain, but influenced by Jainism. Um, oh. I mean, if you think what a Jain extremist would look like, I mean, we're talking about someone who wears a mask always so that they're not even hurting bacteria in the air. Someone who sweeps Aww. the ground. Someone who sweeps the ground when they walk so that they're not stepping on insects. Um, there are Janes who fast all the, like, constantly. Um, like, harmfully so sometimes. Are these and, the monks you're talking about or an everyday yeah, Jane? Yeah, usually we're talking about monks who do it like this type mm. of extreme fasting. But I mean, honestly, my, my mom still fasts regularly. Um, and it was something you were encouraged to do in our community as a child, like almost a week long fast. Um, I didn't do it, but like, or if not a week long <laughs> fast, then like a, a fast where you eat once a day and mm. not anymore. Um, but it's a lot of giving up stuff you want, giving up your comfort. So you want to eat, don't eat. Um, you want to wear clothes. There are some extreme kind of jeans that are like, I, I'm wearing as little as possible out of a religious uh, thing. Hmm. And it's not that all of us do that, but that is, I mean, that's the idea here. You're giving up possessions on earth. You're giving up materialism. You're trying not to hurt anything. So you could see how that's a good idea, but also can be taken to extremes. Um, but also, you know, one of the things that surprised me is when those new atheist books started coming out. I remember oh, yeah. Sam Harris in The End of Faith actually said something like, you know, extremist religions are all bad. But if we were all extremist Janes, OK, I, I admit the world would not be such a bad place. It was weird to see someone reference like my <laughs> religion that no one knew anything about and saying yeah. like, all right, that one's not as bad as all these other ones, which was a, a weird kind of shock. Yeah, but it is, it is strange when you think about it, why, why a god would put us on the earth with bacteria and insects that he knows right. we're going to step on and then say, right. don't you dare step on them. You know? <laughs> yeah, and it's, I mean, if you think about that, it could get taken to extremes because you can't avoid so much of this stuff. And it's almost, um, I mean, good luck trying to avoid some of that. And there's a guilt factor, too, because if you do step on a bug or if there is something in your house and you swatted a fly, like... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you can imagine that to a kid who doesn't know any better, yeah. that sort of guilt, that leads to a sort of like, oh my God, what have I done? Have I done something really horrifying? Or so it's, yeah. It can get kind of crazy too, because like all religions, like if you actually take what they're teaching you 
to its logical conclusions, it can get scary. And is the religion growing? Is it shrinking? Or I don't have the demographic numbers, but I can tell you anecdotally, I mean, a lot of the Jains I grew up with, they're practicing, but they make exceptions to like every rule, <laughs> whatever they <laughs> like. It's not like they are strict Jains, but it's yeah. not necessarily like, oh, I'm going to avoid telling my kids about it. They're not doing that either. Um, I can tell you there are a number of Jain temples across the United States. It's Ooh. it's popular in a certain part of India, like the western section of India. Um, I don't know if it's growing or not growing, but I can tell you, I mean, in terms of philosophy, um, the ideas that it stands behind, those kind of do get incorporated into a lot of cultures and other religions too. So, um, whether or not it's growing, there are communities of Jains and like so many other uh, immigrants and other smaller religions, depending on where you live in America, like Chicago has a huge population of Jains. There are parts of New Jersey and Texas that have huge populations of Jains. California, too, I think. Like, there are places where we have clustered because our communities were always there. Is that why your parents moved to, to Chicago? It's not because why they... they moved there, but it certainly was like a lot of their the people that they immigrated with oh, have yeah, ended yeah. up living here and jobs kind of take people in different places. But um, certainly through my dad's job and stuff, we ended up moving here and I'm sure uh, whatever else was happening in their life, they didn't mind coming back to Chicago or a part of it because they knew family friends were going to be around. Well, things change for you when during your teen years, you move from one part of Chicago to another. And that meant new friends, new high school, and generally starting over. Now, this is when you really started to uh, question your beliefs, wouldn't you say? Yeah, uh, that's the thing that was the first domino to fall. So I started, you know, looking up what happens if you don't believe in God. I don't even think the word atheist came to my mind. I didn't know the word so much. But it's like, what happens if you doubt? What uh, is anyone else having the same concerns that I am? Is anyone else mm -hmm. having the same doubts? Turns out they were. They weren't coming from the same background as me, but they were asking a lot of the same questions. And it was, you know, anytime you have a question about anything and you see someone else able to talk about it in a way that is true to you, and it's like you're think you're like in my head right now, and you're you've thought through this in a way that mm -hmm. I haven't yet. Like, that is important. It's why religion can be powerful. And it's why yeah. Joe Rogan can be popular. I mean, someone who you think they talk like they're confident and what they say seems to make sense to you. I mean, that's always been a draw. But I'm telling you, like, the thing that distinguishes, I hope, what I was doing from the rabbit holes people can go down these days is I wasn't just listening to those people. I was looking for other sources of evidence. Hmm. I was trying to look up what other people were saying. And it seemed like I was getting accurate information that held up from one group of people. And it was the people criticizing God and saying, here's why God doesn't exist. And I mean, just to be clear, these are almost nowadays, it's easy to say this. These are like rudimentary atheism 101 type of arguments but when you've never heard them before, someone pointing out like why there are different religions out there and yeah. the ludicrous claims that religion makes and how there's no evidence for that. Um, and where did God come from? And all I mean, those types of things that maybe you've never thought about before until you start questioning it. It's mind blowing when you first encounter it and it only yeah. leads to more questions. But as I read the Christian books, and as I spent months attending an amazing variety of churches in different parts of the country, I kept running across a consistent and troubling truth about American Christianity. It's clear that most churches have aligned themselves against non-religious people. By adopting this stance, Christians have turned off the people I would think they want to connect with. Hammond, people who know you and your work are very familiar with your book, I Sold My Soul on eBay, Viewing Faith Through an Atheist's Eyes. Now, this book recounts a time when you offered your soul on auction site eBay and the events that came about after someone actually won it. So let's hear the whole story. Why did you do this and what happened afterwards? Sure. It, it feels like a world ago at this point, but basically I was, I think I was, 
in grad school or maybe I had just left grad school because I didn't enjoy it and I was trying to figure out what to do. I was working with some atheist organizations, nonprofits. So I was involved in like the activism side of things. And what mm. I figured out is everyone I'm surrounded by here, they're they're all atheists, but they seem to have left Christianity or Catholicism, uh, Protestantism or Catholicism, and not so much. They didn't share my background, but they all had church experience. They all went there. Whereas everything I knew about Christian churches was secondhand in my experience. And part of it is it didn't mean I was wrong or they were wrong or anything like that. It's I was lacking this firsthand experience about something every atheist around me seemed to know really well. Um, and also I had free time, you know, which uh, I was like, what do I do with my life right now? And I think if I have this chronology right, because it's been a while, I basically, eBay was big at the time. And I basically put on there, I will go to church to wherever the highest bidder wants me to go. I'll donate the money, but like, I'll go to church for you. I'll write about it somewhere. I don't know where, um, but I thought that would be a cute little fun stunt for like a day. You know, I'll go there. I get the experience of going and experiencing it, but also it's not just me going. I'm going to talk to people about it. I want to write about it. I don't know where, but I'll do it. And maybe someone would get a kick out of it. And long story short, that kind of took off. It went viral at a time when hmm. things when things going viral meant something. And people were paying attention to the auction. And it ended up yeah. that a priest won the auction for over $500, which wow. was 50 times more than I thought it was uh, going to go for. And I owed him technically a year's worth of church going every week. Oh, and, no. <laughs> yeah, totally out of hand. And what he told me, he's like, uh, his name is Jim. And he said, I don't want you to do a week of church for a year because you're going to hate church if you do that. He basically said, listen, <laughs> why don't you go to like 10 churches? And since you don't know the landscape of like the evangelical world, and he does, he said, let me pick them for you. I'm going to I'm going to send hmm. you to a variety of non-denominational churches. Huh. In Chicago, he didn't live in Chicago, but he knew the landscape. So he's like, I'll send you to a mega church. I'll send you to a black church on the south side of Chicago. I'll send you to a guy's living room because he holds, he has a small church. It's a church plant. It's brand new. And, um, hmm. and he said, in exchange, just write about your experiences on his ministry's website and we'll call it a deal. And I'm like, fine, because I only had to go to 10 places. Well, that was fine. <laughs> yeah. And I, ended, I did that. I went to these places for him over the course of a couple of months. And um, what I what was amazing about it is not only did I get the firsthand experience that I was looking for, even when I criticized the churches in my write-ups because they were uh, stereotyping atheists in ways that didn't ring true to me, even mm. when they were doing things that were so, it seemed brainwashy in a way, and I said so, there were people commenting on his ministry's website because they were following this journey. They weren't just mm. Christians, but they were commenting in like a civil, interesting way. And it's like, you, okay. it's so weird to see that on any comment thread, right? Um, but people were chiming in and they're like, I went to church and I hated that about church. And people saying, you know, you experienced that, but I'm a Christian and let me tell you what they were actually trying to do. Um, but it, these are civil conversations about it. And it was awesome. Like, it was a good experience. I don't regret having that experience. I did not convert. Uh, Jim, the guy who bought, bought my soul. I should say, by the way, I did not sell my soul. That was just the headline yeah. people went with. Um, but fine, whatever. If that is what people remember it by, so be it. But um, Jim also liked it because he was kind of going to church leaders and saying, you want to draw atheists and non-believers to your church. Well, guess what? I sent someone to your church. Here's what he said about you. He didn't like it. And what are you going to do about that? And like sending them the write-ups. <laughs> and, and along the way, this Christian book company said, this is fascinating because evangelical Christians especially love reading about themselves. Like they like, they like buying books about church culture. And they're like, why don't we send you, Hemet, to more churches after you're done with Jim, um, yeah. and we'll have you, and we'll turn that into a book. So I ended up writing a book Ooh. called "I Sold My Soul on eBay," which is really my experience explaining how I got to that point and what I learned by visiting all of these churches. 
and it was in it was geared toward a Christian audience. But that's kind of that whole thing. But um, I would just say like if I read the if I wrote the book today, it would be a very different book. I think I have more knowledge Ooh. of that world, you know. But I would also say the thing that I took away from that is writing about these experiences live, going to churches, writing for Jim, getting that feedback, taking it, and then using that when I go to the next experience was awesome. And yeah. as someone who did not consider myself a writer, um, it was a cool experience to get that back and forth. And so after the whole experience and as the book was coming out, I was like, why don't I keep, I want I want a space where I can keep talking about atheism and religion and all these things that turned into the friendly atheist blog. And I've actually kept that going in some form or another for like the past 15 years now. Wow. Amazing. And it's, it's, it's quite a unique thing, which happened, not just from your perspective, but from, from Jim's as well, really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're still in touch we don't talk that much, but like he's, he's still lived up to that. He wasn't, he wasn't like lying about his intentions and he still is religious, but he's, I think I could say this on his behalf. He's frustrated with the direction a lot of churches have gone. Um, and I obviously share that view. And so it's kind of an interesting mix here where like he's as critical of the church as anyone, as any atheist I've ever met. Um, but he's coming at it from a different angle. Wow. So perhaps he, sh he should like uh, advertise for someone else like you to like do what you did. Yeah. And then, you know, like take away, you know, sort of like the undercover boss in reverse sort of thing. It, you know, he's and, uh, he's actually done that. He's done that a oh. few times in different ways. Um, just always trying to get like the attention of religious leaders who make it a point like we want to save people. We want to reach the unreached or the unchristian people out there. Um, and he's very much of the mindset, you're doing it wrong. And let me help you because atheists are not buying what you are selling. And by the way, he's right. The demographics have shown more young people are less religious, you know, and that's been an ongoing trend for the past 15 years. Leviticus 25. It's time for one of the longer chapters in Leviticus, all about the celebration of Sabbath and the celebration of Jubilee and the celebration of slavery. Again. We have a disaster relief so that if a tsunami strikes, we can act quickly and mobilize people and give money to groups that are doing the good work that they need to do. None of them proselytize, so your money is going to a good place, but it's doing that. But let me tell you, so last year we had our first conference for Foundation Beyond Belief, and I'm telling you it was the most inspirational thing I've ever been to. I heard people talking, no one talked about God. They were, they were all atheists, I think, but none of them talked about God. Like one guy talked about how he took a trip to like India, and he saw kind of what Mother Teresa's group was doing there. Um, and there's some things they do good and a lot of things they do bad. And he's like, I think I can do what they're doing, and I can do it better and I can do it without the Catholic influence. And that's what he did. He quit his job and just went. It's like, holy crap, that's amazing. So the eBay auction started you off on atheist activism, as you've said. Uh, this has included writing for Pathios and now the Friendly Atheist blog. You've given talks, helped run charitable events, and make frequent YouTube videos. So what kind of topics do you like to tackle and what have been some of the most popular ones? The shift, I think, that has happened is I used to talk, I mean, to me, trying to convince people to become atheists, which was the thing that drew me into the fold, I wanted to mm. continue that. I don't really do that anymore. I don't really care anymore if anyone's an atheist or not. The thing that's driving me these days is kind of the implication of religion, that intersection of religion and politics. Mm. So I don't care if you're religious. I'm more interested in what you are doing with your beliefs, whether you're atheist or religious or what have you. So really, if you found my website now, it's a lot of articles about Christian nationalism, religious extremism, um, and not, I mean, I would hope religious people could read pretty much anything I write or put out there and basically say, yeah, I agree with all of that. Because it's not saying mm. religion is wrong. It's saying religion is not a virtue. Uh, here is an example of where it's bad. Here's something that progressive Christians ought to be on my side with. Um, so I used to write for uh, a website called Patheos, which was kind of a hub 
for all kinds of religious, oh, yes. non-religious thinking. Um, and recently, after like they, they've gone through different owners over the years, but I think recently they had to make a business decision, which was, you know, the mm. biggest people giving them money are Christian ministries and companies wow. saying we want to sell products to Christians. At the same time, the most popular draws on their website are atheists like me saying religion is bad and you shouldn't trust what religious <laughs> leaders tell you. And I mean, you can't, I mean, that's the problem. You have people bringing people to the website mm. who are criticizing religion, but the money is coming from people who are trying to sell you religion. They decided like, we got to make a push for the money people because it's a business. You can't be mad yeah. at them for that. So that's kind of understandable, said, I guess. So they kind of gave us a heads up and said, we're going to move in this direction. If you want to talk about why being an atheist is good, that's fine. But if you want to just trash religion all the time, we're going to say no to that. And it's your decision what you want to do. And it turned out at the same time that was happening, um, a website called Only Sky was developing yep. where they said, we want to make a push to reach all these non-religious people. So if you want to criticize religion, fine. If you want to talk about how you're an atheist and this piece of literature or art or music inspired you, cool. We want that too. It was an easy move for me saying, all right, I'm going to leave Patheos and go to this other site because they're doing the stuff I want to see. That's like the next phase, right? It's not about yeah. deconverting you. It's about saying you're already an atheist. Where do you go from here? So that's why I now write it only, Sky. Um, but I think the bigger shift is I now focus on politics and religion and a lot of issues connected to religion that I think even religious people could agree with me on. And I'm more interested in what people do with their faith and their beliefs and their non-belief uh, than whether they just happen to be atheists. Um, and actually, that's an interesting story because that's kind of what happened on YouTube as well. Um, several years ago, a filmmaker who was based in Chicago said he wanted to make a documentary about young atheists. And I've written a lot about young atheists, so he wanted mm. to talk to me about young atheists. And that's fine. Like, that's cool. Let's bring a camera in. We'll talk about it. And whatever project you do with it, let's you do whatever you want to do. And we ended up, he said, like, can I just ask you some atheism 101 questions? You know, where do you get hmm. your morality from? If someone wants to come out as an atheist, what should they do? Pretty basic questions for someone who's been talking about atheism for a while. And I answered those questions, assuming they were for this documentary of whatever project he was working on. And um, because he didn't quite know what he wanted to do in terms of the film, he kind of sliced mm. up those answers, put them on YouTube under the Atheist Voice channel. And what was amazing to both of us is those clips that were just a softball question and me trying to answer it off the cuff. They actually got a lot of views. And it's not like we mm. were advertising it, really. People just were like using YouTube the way I use Google. Like, what happens if I don't believe in God? What oh, uh, yes. is, is God real? Things like that. And they were Sound stumbling bites. upon. Yeah. And they were stumbling upon those videos. And they some of them went really popular. So we ended up having hmm. a little fun with it. It's like, what things should you not say to an atheist? And we made a little video on that. And that got like millions of views. And it's like, we're not even trying here. What the hell's going on? <laughs> it's always um, the one you don't expect that does well. Yeah, <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And the ones you put a lot of thought and time into get nothing. Nothing. Um, <laughs> right. But um, we ended up doing that for many years. By the way, he moved over time, and we still found a way to keep it going for a while, where I would hmm. write my own softball questions and try to answer them. And he would edit the videos and put them up. And we did that for a long time. And then both of us kind of came to a place in our lives where it's like, I had a child. My, I was moving, he was working on different projects that we just kind of set it aside for a while. And when I was ready to come back to it, um, we were both in different places in our life. And I was like, you know, it's coming to the point where if you're making content online, I should really learn how to edit my own videos and put out my own videos. So I started my own channel, Friendly Atheist channel on YouTube, and kind of started working on other video types and putting them out and editing them myself, which is hard and annoying and sometimes but it's good it's an important skill to learn right so i stopped the atheist voice channel like years ago the videos are still up but i just kind of focused on my friendly atheist channel where i've written some atheist 101 stuff but it's a lot of reacting to atheism in the news and christian nationalism in the news 
and going through the Bible chapter by chapter. Like, it's just something new to try out. But it's been interesting because the people who read my stuff online are very different from the people who watch my stuff on YouTube. And so you, it turns out you're reaching different audiences depending on the platforms that you're using. Well, as most atheist activists will know, speaking out about non-belief and the harm of organized religion can result in a lot of pushback from believers, often very vehement pushback. Hammond, how have believers reacted to you over the years, family members as well as the general public? And I don't just want to focus on the negative comments. Tell us about any positive feedback you've received from theists as well. Believe it or not, the response I've gotten over the years is overwhelmingly positive. Um, I will say for like my family, by and large, we don't talk about this stuff. Um, I honestly, if you ask my parents, what do I do every day? I don't think they could answer you. Uh, I just kind of do my thing. We don't really discuss this uh, with family members, but to the general public, it's been overwhelmingly positive. And anecdotally, talking to other atheists who write or talk about it for a living, who do it full time, they've gotten a lot of backlash. I have found mostly, I have mostly avoided it. And the reason I think is because, again, I am not here, I don't spend a lot of my time trying to convince random strangers online to stop believing in God. I don't mm. care. What I'm talking about is here is how religion is being used to hurt people. Mm. And I think most religious people who see that would say, yeah, I agree. I may be religious, but that's that type of religion I oppose. And that's not the church I go to. You know what I mean? And so mm. I've gotten... I've gotten plenty of feedback over the years, positive feedback from religious people who are like, you know, I disagree with you on the God thing, but I appreciate the stuff you're saying because I agree with it. And are there crazy fundamentalists who try to convert me? Yes. Are there people who have gone over the top and scary? Yes. But those are few and far between. Like by and large, I've gotten positive feedback from most people. And it's because the stuff I talk about, I, I'm not just out here. I don't think people are stupid for believing in God. I don't think religion itself is necessarily a big problem. It's what you're doing with it. And I try to make sure I'm focusing my criticism on people who deserve it. Um, and I think when you do that, you find mm. that a lot of people tend to agree and they understand where you're coming from on that. So, you know, uh, it's not that I have avoided backlash. It's that, you know, for the most part, the sort of people who reach out to me, like, what are they going to be mad about? Are they mad that I'm attacking like religion being used to push purity culture and hurt women or force them to give birth like or hurt LGBTQ people? Like who's going to be mad about that? N not anyone I care to hear from. And so, you know, the it depends. I think the big takeaway here is you can't be afraid of backlash. There's going to be backlash, but is it the right kind? And I think... You know, if I'm getting pushback from people whose opinions I don't value in the first place, I don't care. If if I'm getting backlash from people whose opinions I respect, and, and believe me, that has happened, and sometimes they're right, and I do have to adjust. But if I'm getting backlash from people whose opinions I wasn't taking seriously in the first place because I have mm. reasons for that, I can live with that, you know? So, you know, if you're talking, there's no nice way to tell people that they're, that the thing they believe in that guides them, that motivates them, there's no nice way to tell them that they're being lied to. Um, mm. So it's like, I, who cares if I get backlash about that? But I hope that when I'm criticizing religion, I'm not painting everyone with a broad brush. I'm trying to yeah. say like, no, this is conservative Christians or this is the Jehovah's Witnesses or, you know, it's, it's this specific mm. group. And by the way, I shouldn't be the only one saying this. I hope religious people who are progressive and say, I believe in acting the way Jesus acted and not doing just what some preacher says the Bible says, I would hope they're on my side. And what about uh, uh, Jains? What do they, if they know that you're a Jain or, rec or, or recognize that, you, you, you know, yeah. that you've spoken about Jainism, uh, what have they said about leaving, uh, leaving that faith? You know, I used to get more letters from Jane's when the eBay stuff was happening. I really haven't heard from many in the years since. And I don't know if it's because I don't necessarily advertise that and I don't single out mm. Jainism for criticism so much. So I really haven't heard from Jane's in the past like 10 years about anything. 
But, you know, mostly it's like they find out I'm still vegetarian because I am. Um, and again, when it comes to Jainism, even in the news, it is so rarely in the news at all. And the yeah. couple times it is, it's like, oh, they were promoting fasting and some kid did it and they got seriously sick or worse. It's like those are things legitimately that I think any Jane should criticize. So I honestly haven't heard much from my own community on that front. Well, it's been so fascinating talking to you, Hemant. I've been a fan of your work for many, many years, and it's really good to finally be able to get you on the show to tell your story. So what are you working on at the moment uh, that you can tell us about? The, honestly, the this is kind of loosely structured, but I write articles about news stories at Only Sky. Just search for that. You'll find it. If you prefer, uh, if you're on YouTube right now, just uh, make sure you search for The Friendly Atheist and subscribe to that channel. I would appreciate it. There's also a podcast, Friendly Atheist Podcast, where myself and a co-host discuss a lot of the news stories that pertain yep. to religion and atheism that happened in the past week. So basically, I try to put myself out there in ways that, again, I'm trying to reach an audience that may not be hardcore atheists in the sense that they want to convert you to atheism. But I'm hoping that a lot of people are listening who might want to know, okay, this happened in the news but how should I be thinking about it if I care about mm. church-state separation and critical thinking and things like that? Uh, so if any of those are appealing to you, I hope people will find me there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's always a mix of what goes on in those platforms. I will leave links to your books, blogs, and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Hemant, for coming on to Talk Beliefs. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks for giving me the chance to talk. Uh, to your audience. And if anyone wants to find me who's watching your show, uh, just Google Friendly Atheist. You'll find my contact info. Um, and thanks for listening. If you if you sat through this whole thing, good for you. Like, that's awesome. I hope you learned something. And I hope whoever you are, if you care about these issues, find a way to speak out about them however you feel comfortable with. <laughs> <laughs>